Hey everybody, welcome back to our video game esoteric and we're continuing the series on the Mr. FPGA DE10 Nano Project. And what we're going to be doing today is a fun and very different video for Friday, because every time I talk about Mr. I get comments asking to explain what an FPGA chip does, how it differs from software emulation, and why that's important. And I usually comment back saying it's very hard to describe via messages. So today what I'm going to do is break down what an FPGA is, how it functions in Mr., and how logic elements work, all through the use of Sour Patch Kids. No joke, it will be my visual aid. Before you get too far involved though, do me a huge favor, go down below, hit like and subscribe and all that jazz because this was a fun video to make but it did take me a little bit of time. At the heart of Mr. or any FPGA chip is obviously the FPGA or Field Programmable Gate Array. Sometimes it sounds like I say Gatorade, it's just my accent. That's where you get FPGA from. It is just an acronym describing what this does. What it means is the logic on this chip is reprogrammable, unlike your CPU and your computer system where all of the logic in that is basically baked in at the foundry. So what Mr. has is 110,000 LEs and the long form of LE is just going to be the following logic elements. Basically, this is what comprises the chip. Now, the theoretical on this is that if you have 110,000 LEs and a PlayStation 1 core only uses 80,000 logic elements, that means the design for recreating a PlayStation 1 and FPGA logic works. You have overhead. If you needed 115,000 logic elements to fit a PlayStation 1 core on this current chip, you either have to refine the design to fit it or it just does not work whatsoever. Because you're dealing with different custom chips on the hardware, the PlayStation 1 has two customs as well as some associated partner chips that you're taking a look at here on two different boards. But in FPGA, what the developers are doing, something like FPGA Zoom Spots, is basically recreating the functionality of these chips in field programmable gate array logic. But let's take a look at another chip and kind of discuss that in a little bit. And of course, because it is my example, the only loose chip I have pulled from a board is going to be the Bulldog chip from a 3DO M2 console. Not the one in front of you. I actually got three of these. Two were sent off to be delitted and scanned. And that is going to be a topic of this video about how you even understand the logic of a chip in the first place. But hey, I had it in my desk for you guys who want to see it. So taking a look at the physical chip here, we have all those different ball grid array posts in the back. Some of them would be ground, some of them would be voltage, some of them would be signal lines. But everything inside of this piece of silicon is what makes up basically one third of a 3DO M2. So if we wanted to recreate that in FPGA, maybe something that'll happen in the future, who knows, we need to understand how it functions and how that could be rewritten in Verilog and HDL or hardware description language to be able to put it onto an FPGA chip. They're basically just programming languages that describe hardware. But let's get to the Sour Patch Kids. I have a blue Sour Patch Kid, I have a yellow Sour Patch Kid, I'm gonna have a red Sour Patch Kid, and I'm also going to have an orange Sour Patch Kid. And these are my visual examples of different types of logic elements or gates that we could be using to recreate software. And trust me, I know I shouldn't have picked Sour Patch Kids. That sugar got everywhere. It was a hell of a cleanup at the end, but it did make the most sense for me because I am a visual teacher having taught college in film. The blue one, that could be an end gate. There's a different type of gates that you can use in logic. These are the four most common, but they do evolve from there into different functions. If we go down to the yellow one, this could be an OR gate. I will leave a link in the description to define what these mean. It's a little bit more technically minor than the video requires. The red one could be a ZOR gate or an XOR gate. It's pronounced different ways. Leave me a comment down below and tell me how you pronounce it if you are an engineer. And the last one could be a NOT gate. You can take these four types of gates and describe some sort of circuit. And in FPGA, we can use either HDL or Verilog to be able to understand and program it so that we could take those available logic elements on the DE10 Nano and recreate a chip. Now let's take a look at something like the PC Engine here and let's talk about how you would get something like that on a Mister. Now remember, it does have 110,000 logic elements, but I don't have 110,000 Sour Patch Kids. That would be way too much candy for one person. But let's say that the entire core is comprised of the following, and let's say each one counts as a 10,000 unit. We would have two of one function, one of another function, we'll have three of a third function, and then we will put the fourth function in right now also as two. So let's say, we have 80,000 logic elements that build up a PC engine, the CD-ROM system, and the hue cart on Mister. That is what's being reconfigured when you load that core up. Now, it is much more complex than that. It's not just these four different variables, but you get an idea of what would be comprised of a PC engine system. Now, let's say we need to do something like a PlayStation 1. 
Upon the core's boot, when you select the core, it reprograms the logic based upon the code the developer has given it. So now if we need to make it a PlayStation 1 and not a PC engine, all of the logic is going to pivot to recreate the silicon from a PlayStation 1 in field programmable gate array. So that might mean adding a function, that might be subtracting a function, that may mean 101,000 different changes that could be made. But as we add and subtract candy here, basically what I'm trying to show is a visual representation of how the code in the FPGA and those logic gates would differ between systems. Now one advantage that FPGA has over software emulation, and don't go down below and comment run ahead, I'm going to be talking about that at the end of the video, is that FPGA can run instructions in parallel or at the same time. If these four color candies represent four different instructions that are required for something like a Super Nintendo game to play on Mr. Those four instruction sets or functions are going to run in parallel simultaneously. If we go over to the right in just a moment, software emulation runs sequentially. That means those four instructions have to happen one after the other. Now, of course, the Super Nintendo has a very slow CPU, under 10 megahertz, and the processor in my PC runs at 5.2 gigahertz on turbo, which means that generally that doesn't have as big of an effect as you would think it would because modern CPUs are so fast. If we need five instructions to run something like Super Mario World, we have to add that fifth instruction to happen on that frame sequentially on software emulation. Now lag definitely does exist and there are other ways to combat it or add it to your system. If you're using an analog television, you're going to be reducing lag down. Now there's two different types of lag, perceivable lag and mathematical lag. Something like an LCD, depending on the model, can have more lag than something like a CRT and different LCDs are going to have different lag. Even something like a controller can affect this entire configuration. If you use something like a snack adapter, you can reduce your latency down because you're basically using a serial connection versus going over USB. But when I say perceivable lag versus measurable lag, you might not be able to tell there's any lag in your gameplay, even though theoretically we could measure maybe a frame of lag. If you can't tell, does it really exist? Leave me a comment down below and tell me what you think. Now, if you go to a different controller setup, something like a USB controller, you will have a different experience and different controllers will have different polling latency or lag. If you use a USB hardwired connection, that is nine times out of 10 going to give you less lag because you have it hardwired into the Mr.'s USB hub. If you move over to something like a Bluetooth or a 2.4 gigahertz wireless adapter, you can introduce more lag into the system. So saying that FPGA is lagless is not technically correct because there's a lot of ways to introduce lag. And I know I said earlier, don't comment, run ahead down below. I also love software emulation. This is not a video saying how great FPGA is, how bad software emulation is. I take my Steam Deck with me all the time and I play it because it's a 10 times better portable system than Mr. The joke being that Mr. really isn't portable whatsoever. I don't really notice lag whatsoever in a game like Splatterhouse 2, but if I play something like a shmup or a fighting game, I may notice a little bit of lag on those inputs. It might be because of the Steam Deck screen latency, it might be because of the emulation. In reality, it's a combination of both. But RetroArch and many other emulators have what's called Run Ahead. Now this is very complicated, but what it basically boils down to is it's almost time travel. It will basically run the game in advance, look for your inputs, have a save state, and then reverse the game to the moment you push that button to reduce the lag down to original hardware specifications. It is a mathematical formula with a lot of pulling of the controls and it gets much more complex. But my point being is that software emulation, even though it does run sequentially for those instructions, can still be a lagless experience. Now the question is, how does somebody even know what's on a piece of silicon or a chip in the first place? There's many different ways reverse engineering it, but some people actually do decap these chips and do die scans to look at the actual logic underneath a microscope. And because you'll see something like CPS2 here, that does use Gatorade technology as well. FPGAs are not a new tech. They've been around since the 90s and probably even before that. This is just when I get familiar with them. But somebody will take the Capcom CPS2 CPU and scan it. You'll see in the top right hand corner that is the CPU core. And then all around it are logic gates, the same type of gates that are in Mr. Obviously the nanometer architecture has gotten better, 
But when you saw those gates there, it's a lot of what we're describing when we talk about Mister and how to use those logic elements to reprogram that FPGA to act as whatever console you may like it to be. But I hope that answers the question as to what an FPGA is, why it's important for Mister, and how it functions using candy. And did you eat all the candy afterwards? Let me tell you, that sugar got everywhere. But that's what Mr. does. That FPGA chip on the middle board reprograms itself based on Verilog and HDL code to mimic the silicon inside of an actual machine. It's not much different than what software emulation does. It just uses a completely different means and technology to achieve the same result. Short of that, if you have any questions, leave them down below. If I can answer any more, I'd be happy to. But hopefully this video and then candy kind of explain a little bit more what's inside your Mr. Short of that, I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.